All right. Um, my name is Brad Rancourt. I'm the pastor at Smithfield Baptist Church. Um, I've known Brian for a few years now. We've shared some committees. We've taken some classes together. Um, I made a very rookie mistake uh, about two weeks ago. I was in a meeting, and Brian said, hey, would you like to participate in my graduation? I was like, sure. Anything you need me to do. Anything at all. Going to chop that one down for figuring out better ways to say that next time. As I'm up here delivering the graduation message. Um, but I am, uh, I am honestly humbled to be here. Not that Brian would think of me or how many people before him said no. Before me said no. Um, but I graduated from AIM myself last year. So... Um, I've been out there for a year post-AIM. It feels kind of like coming home, like if you're a soldier who goes off to war, you come home and you're a lot more grizzled. <laughs> you're a lot more refined and you just, I've seen stuff, everyone. I've seen stuff. But um, it's absolutely an amazing program. I'm probably cycling right into the advanced courses as John has gone through already. Um, I took a year off. That's as long as I believe I'm allowed to contractually do that. So I'm excited for it. And I'm going to get up here now. Um, I've been a pastor for a year and a half now, which means I obviously know everything there is about being a spiritual leader in this world. I've maxed out at my knowledge. Cannot learn anything more. 100% of the time now, people will only take from me. I'll never take from them. If you guys still believe this, I have a boat to sell you. It's me after. But, uh, no, I mean, I, I'm fairly confident that I can be a pastor for the next 60 years, and I will still not even be able to scratch the surface of what I need to know. That's the depth. So for me to get up here and talk about to two pastors who no doubt have been in ministry longer than I've been, uh, I've been a pastor, who's worked with God longer than I've no doubt been alive, to get up here and act like I know it all would be really kind of an embarrassment on me, and I embarrass myself several ways, and that's not going to be one of them this time. <laughs> what I want to talk about is I want to talk about things that I've learned in my last year, things that I've figured out that I didn't think that I had to figure out, and things that may help you guys along the way. And I have two of them that I'm going to highlight. One is how to navigate this world as a spiritual leader, even as a Christian. And then how do we allow the world to interact with our church while being faithful to our congregation? And yes, I'm watching the clock, so I'm not going to be four hours like I hoped I could have been. <laughs> um, one thing that comes to mind that we see a lot of is we, we see a lot of people saying that Christianity is under attack in America now, and it's been worse than it ever has been. And I think that's incredibly disingenuous for us to take that point, because every generation has their own struggles. Every generation has their own trials and tribulations, and every generation has to interact with the world differently. But I will say that we have something very unique that not a lot of generations, in fact, none of them have, and that is the sheer access to information that we have. And I'll say it this way. I remember when I was a, in grade school, 10, 11, 12, I'm not sure exactly when, um, my mom had never found a door-to-door -door salesman that she didn't want to buy something from. And so right next to our Electrolux vacuum, I had an entire box set of the Encyclopedia Britannica. I remember when I got it, and my mom spent a couple hundred dollars. She was confident that this was going to make me a lawyer. She gave me a formal name, hoping that I would be a lawyer. She's like, you're going to have to have Brad in instead of just Brad. Joke's on her. But... I felt like I had all the information in the world at my fingertips. There was nothing in the world that was known that wasn't right there on my shelf. My little tiny bedroom looked like a law office from one side, and it was perfect. And 25 years later, I have one of these. <laughs> Our smartphones, at the press of a button, can give us access to about 5 billion articles commentaries, opinion pieces, editorials, conversation rooms, raw data, statistics, historical documents, right at our fingertips. I, play, I was playing a game when I was kind of coming up with what I, what I wanted to talk about. I typed into Google, who is God? My Google search maxed out at 5 million responses. 
There's not enough lifetimes for us in here to read all of those. But that's just the sheer breadth of what we have at our fingertips. And it is such an amazing blessing for us. And it's also a curse. It's a blessing because as a pastor, our job gets easier when we have access to this. I have an app on my phone that at any given time, I can pull it up and it will give me 35 to 40 biblical translations side by side. I don't have to open 100 books on my desk like I imagine the monks used to, just to find differences. It's right there. If I wanted to spend $5.99 to upgrade the app, it would highlight the differences for me, but that takes too much of the fun out of it. <laughs> As a pastor, we have commentaries everywhere that we could use. We have sermon illustrations. We can pull up other people's sermons if you really want to be lazy and break copyright laws. You can do anything you want with your phone at your fingertip now. If you're someone in the laity, if you're not a pastor, you have countless amounts of devotionals. You can listen to any pastor, any Sunday, from anywhere in the world. And if you miss them, they archive them for you. If you want to listen to Timothy Keller tomorrow, you can. If you wanted to listen to how Timothy Keller preached 20 years ago versus now, you absolutely can do that. If you want to see a Martin Luther sermon, you can pull it up. It's all at our fingertips. If you want to get in a small group in which you can talk about like-minded theology and you want to wrestle and do cross-country Bible studies, you can. I'm in a Bible study in a closed Facebook group right now, which is 17,000 other people. And you know, if you're a non-believer, you lose one excuse that we've heard, no doubt, in our life, which is, what happens to the people who don't know God? They just don't exist in America anymore. You will be presented with God everywhere that you can possibly imagine. People are able to be accepting or convicting by that whenever they desire. But this amount of technology comes with a few major drawbacks. Because you can get countless amounts of information, the information doesn't tell you if it's right or wrong. The information doesn't tell you if you're using it right. On top of that, much of the information has an agenda. It has a bias. It can shade statistics and it can shade facts one way or another. I remember the old idiom, uh, statistics don't lie, but liars use statistics. Have you ever heard that? Yeah. Well, we're living in that world in hyperdrive right now. And so it makes it easier for us to access information. It makes it a lot harder for us to access true information. That's where our ministry has gone. How do we separate the fact from the fiction? And I know I have posted things on social media and said, this has to be true. This looks right. And then I found out that it's wrong. We all have done that. We're all guilty of this. It's just part of how hard it is for us to separate it out. Because we have to determine what is true, what is fact, what is spin, what is dangerous manipulation. We see, it, we see it with biblical manipulation all the time. I see a lot of people who struggle with theology when we're working through some of these groups. You see people who take scripture out of context because they want it to tell them something that they want to hear, not what it actually hears. We have people who take it out of context to justify an action they want to do rather than what it actually should be used for. I've seen passages overlooked because it didn't support the point of view they were trying to make. I read a fantastic article from someone that was talking about John chapter 14, it was through verses 1 through 10. Magically, they left out verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, because it didn't fit their narrative. And we have to tear through that, all of us, not just pastors who have to get up on Sunday and deliver God's truth, but laity who needs to truly know what Scripture is. And we can manipulate Scripture any way you want. Would you like me to do, it, do this for an example with you right now? My mouth is as dry as it ever has been possible. But it's all right. I will survive. I will persevere. Um, here's, your, here's an example. I sit down with my wife and our doctor, and she says, Brad, you need to lose weight. This isn't fat shaming for myself. 
I know my weaknesses. You have to lose weight, you need to start exercising. And I said, okay, and she says, we're gonna start running together. I'm like, I don't, I don't wanna do that. I don't wanna start running. No, we're gonna have to start running together. Now I could quote Proverbs 28.1, which says, the wicked run when no one is chasing them. Thank you very much. Am I doing service to scripture doing that? There's not a lot of no's here. You guys, have you utilized that before? And so, we not only have to prepare ourselves as spiritual leaders and members of laity who may be supporting a church, but we also have to make sure that we have the courage to represent God in our churches. Because one thing that I learned very early on is it is terrifying. Raise your hand in here if you're a pastor, if you had a fear at one point that you would one day be preaching to an empty church. Is that I think that's 100% of them, right? Well, that's terrifying. And that scared me as a little pastor who just graduated from a coming to a somewhat established church with a tenured pastor, Reverend Bert Brewster, Reverend Dr. Bert Brewster, if that's not intimidating enough. I uh, pastored there for 40 years, and I'm stepping in to fill in. The first thing out of my mind was, I'm going to say something to make people leave. I'm going to mess something up. I'm going to do something wrong. And people are going to walk out. And you know what? That made my first several messages really boring. <laughs> it made them bland. It made them all fluff. And I'll just go get them, tiger, at the end of it. There was very little discipleship in it. There was very little convicting. And if I'm being honest in front of you guys, I let my self-esteem drive my first several messages more than I let the Holy Spirit drive it. Because I found myself getting to a point of, I should preach about this in the scripture. I probably shouldn't. I know XYZ is dealing with XYZ. I'm not sure how they would take that if I said that. And then as I was studying, it was probably a month or a month and a half in, I landed on Galatians chapter 1, verse 10, which I keep very close to me. And it says, Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. And then I said, you know what? If I'm really convicted not to preach on this, and it's because I've messed up, because I've gone down the wrong rabbit hole, or I used the wrong source online, I get that. But if I feel through prayer the Holy Spirit is telling me, this is your message. If I have six or seven commentaries in front of me that says, this is accurate to what you're preaching on, and if my illustration is timely, beyond more than serendipity, then I chose to take the courage to preach on that topic. And you know what happened? Aside from me being really terrified and having to use a bathroom a bunch of times before we had to do it, people felt refreshed. I believe that there's people out there who are tired of being told what they want to hear. And they want to be told what they need to know. And that's not just a call to pastors, that's a call to laity. If you have friends, you have family, who you know that they get frustrated when you come over because you're just always telling them it's going to be all right, it's going to be all right. And sometimes you should say, it's not going to be all right, we need to fix this, but guess who's going to be right next to you the second every moment we do that? Because I've seen my church grow since I've started to preach this way. And yes, there are times in which I've left the congregation feeling upbeat, feeling inspired, feeling ready to charge out. And yes, there are times in which people have walked out mad because they've been convicted, many cases on a sin they didn't want stared at in their face. But if I could sit back and I could look at my sermon, if I could look back at my study notes, and I could look back at everything and said, there's not one moment in which I could tell that God was telling me to pull a punch, then I stopped pulling a punch. And people are grateful for that. And so those are just two things that I've learned. That technology can be amazing, but wield that power with the reverence it deserves. And there's going to be times in which you need to deliver a message that says we're on the right track, keep going. 
And there's going to be a time when you need to stand up there and say, we need to repent and have courage to tell your congregation that. Have courage to tell your neighbor that. Have courage to tell your friends that. Don't do it in an angry or mean way, doing it with gentle and loving kindness. But be prepared to worship and to serve God and not the people sitting in the pews. Don't worry about the offering plate being filled. God will take care of it. That is a lesson that I learned in my last year. And I know you have been a pastor no longer longer than me, so I hope you got it several years ago. And John, I don't know your background, but I pray you, you understand that well. And I pray all of you, if any of you are thinking of ministry, that you feel that in your heart as well. Just have courage to step boldly with God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the Bible. We thank you for Scripture because Scripture stops our work being our view and it starts it being your view. We can have courage in your word because it's your word. So Lord, I ask that we have courage to follow you boldly. I have courage that we understand that we are far more sinful than we could ever have hoped we could ever imagine ourselves to be, but we are far more loved than we could ever hope. And I pray that those two ideas wrestle in our minds and sanctify us closer to you with every breath we take. Lord, I bless the graduates as they continue following your word. I bless all of the pastors here as they continue to be encouraged by you. And when they feel tired, may they Remember that you are a God who does not get tired. That you will give us strength. Love us, Lord. Be with us. And guard our hearts. For we ask this in the name of the sacrifice of your Son. Amen. Amen.